Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dean Vivek Chowdhury. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vivek Chowdhury, and I'm Dean of the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. Thank you all for joining us today for our second virtual Voices of Experience event with our guest, Sean Menke, CEO of Staber Holdings. As you know, the VOE series has been hosting impactful and engaging conversations with business leaders from around the world for over 10 years. And we're pleased to be able to continue this tradition even during these challenging times in this virtual mode. Let me begin by thanking US Bank for their sponsorship of the VOE series. Without their generous and sustained financial support, the VOE series would not be possible. Next, a couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available on the Voices of Experience website very shortly. This means that you are all now muted, but we do wanna hear from you. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to share any questions that you would like to ask of Sean. And you can do this throughout the course of the conversation. You do not need to wait till the end. But towards the end, my colleague, Kate Dillon, will actually collect a couple of those questions and ask them of Sean. At this point, it is my pleasure to welcome our guest, Sean Menke, CEO of Sabre Holdings and an alumnus of our executive MBA program. Welcome, Sean. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely, we're delighted to have you. Let me go ahead and start with a question on Sabre. So I'm betting that almost everyone in our audience has at some point or the other used Sabre, probably indirectly, but many of them may not know the name Sabre. Can you tell us a little bit about what Sabre Holdings is, what it does? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do this in, a, in just a couple of minutes, but I think people learn very quickly. We actually touch them quite a bit. Um, so Sabre actually was a part of American Airlines that was spun out in the late 90s and the early 2000s. So it's a publicly traded company right now. And there's really three parts of the business. Um, one is what we call the travel network business, which is a global distribution system. And we transact over 120, $130 billion in travel transactions around the world. So we connect to airlines, we connect to hoteliers, we connect to cruise companies uh, throughout the world. And we then take that content, normalize it, and we allow it to go out to the travel agency community. So if you think about the Expedia's of the world, the Travelocities of the world, the, the travel management companies of the world, we do that. In fact, we were the first OTA, we developed the first OTA, Travelocity, and sold it to Expedia. That's one part of the business. Uh, the other is we have what's called airline solutions, which is airline IT. So we actually power American Airlines, JetBlue, Alaska, WestJet, Aeromexico, Latam, Aeroflot, Vietnam Airlines, and more and more airlines around the world, that we are actually their core technology that allows them to essentially operate day in and day out. Uh, part of that is revenue management systems, yield management systems, and also gets into the operating side that we have flight plan management systems that United Airlines uh, uses, South, uh, Southwest uses some of our products. Uh, and then we also have uh, a number of other things that relate to crew planning and crew scheduling. So that's a component of our business. And then that even more than when we touch you around the world is we do central reservation and property management systems for some of the largest hoteliers throughout the world. So uh, you may not know Sabre, but uh, you know, we transact all in all in all three of our businesses, about $250 billion in, in, uh, in, in revenues for our, for our partners around the world. And our top line is $4 billion. Wow. That's interesting. You mentioned something about yield management and revenue management, and you know that as travelers, we're all always curious about that. Uh, so without revealing any inside secrets, can you tell us a little bit about how those uh, functions work? Well, you know, it's, it has a lot to do with a, a level of analytics and takes place as it relates to just supply and demand that's out there. And as you would imagine, um, there's a number of data, data scientists that work as it relates to the algorithms and what's developed. And you know, at the end of the day, you're always sort of scratching your head at the price was $200 yesterday. Why is it $350 tomorrow? It's probably because a few people bought the seat and they're trying to get more revenue is, is, is what, they're, uh, what they're driving towards. 
Yeah, you, you must be changing those prices really often because you know that you can go an hour later and see a different price. Yeah. It, uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, just speaking on this, and this talks about the world we're in today, is, um, you know, these systems are all based on historical information. And guess what? The historical information is completely different right now because there is no historical information. So, um, you know, we're, we have a lot of engagement with customers as it relates to just revenue management when we were talking about how do they think about how do they forecast what's going on. I know we're going to talk more about this. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, speaking of historical information that, as you said, well, can't, no, one, most of us cannot think of any history that compares with what we have uh, on our plate today. So let's uh, walk through a little bit of the timeline. Um, you know, as you know, the hospitality industry and the travel industry uh, are in many ways being looked at as poster trials for what this pandemic is doing to us um, and the disruption it's causing. But from an insider's point of view, when did you start to observe the trends that we are seeing so visibly now? And when did you realize that you have something very serious on our hands? Yeah, what I'd like to do is actually, I'm going to share uh, a couple of slides because I think pictures are worth sort of a thousand, you know, words as it relates to what's taking place here. So let me, let me share my screen here in a moment and I'll walk you through um, what we were seeing. I just want to make sure you guys can see this okay and I'll, I'll go from here. Um, what I'm sharing with you, and this is the one part of the business that I was talking about, that our global distribution system. And, when you look at what I'm articulating here, this is not only Saber, but this is uh, two other uh, GDSs, Travelport and Amadeus, uh, that we compete against in the world. And between the three uh, of the GDSs, Global Distribution Systems, we transact probably about 45, 48% of global air travel. So we have great insight in what's taking place. And what I'm showing you is really what was transpiring as we move into uh, into 2020. And if you really look at the Asia Pacific region, you can see very quickly that bookings are down on a year over year basis. And typically on a year, when you have a year over change over, you see some fluctuation. But we began to pick up what was happening within Asia right away and what was taking place. And then as you can see, uh, going week by week, um, the comp is essentially year over year bookings. It allows us to see what's taking place. And you can see how quickly uh, bookings just began to drop. Uh, year over year. When you get to a point where you actually have bookings that are greater, greater down greater than 100%, what that means is, you know, new bookings are not taking place. But in addition to that, bookings that were taking, that were made in the past, because as you know, as a traveler, you make a booking and you travel in the future. We had a lot of those that were actually canceling off. So that's how quickly we began to see bookings fall away. And this is just another illustration uh, for Saber is if you just look at this is a seven day moving uh, uh, example of what's taking place and it's comparing to 2019, uh, you can see how quickly uh, the bookings fell off. And probably more importantly, if you look at where it's circled at the bottom, uh, that's where we are right now at the bottom. Everybody's looking for green shoots around the world. As you can imagine, we sit on that data. Um, the other thing is, if you look at this chart, uh, the red line shows you just the level of cancellations that were taking place. So no new bookings and then cancellations of bookings that were out there. Uh, this next chart really brings uh, a few different things together. Uh, one is the green line is what I articulated to you with bookings. But we also get to, because of all those systems that I had talked about with airlines, we get to see what's happening as it relates to employments when you're boarding an aircraft. And you can see in the blue line, how quickly that fell off. And then we also, because of our hotel business, we get to see what's happening. So you can see how quickly this actually happened in the marketplace and what we needed to react to. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, as you're observing that trend and I'm um, assuming you're a business whose revenue is generated by transaction volumes and you're watching that revenue stream basically fall off the cliff, how do you react? What, what, what is some of the first things that you do and how do you say, okay, we've got a situation here that we need to deal with? Yeah, let, let me walk you through that because you're absolutely correct. If you look at that 4 billion that I was talking about, 15% of that is what you could call subscription revenue, but the balance of it is uh, really transaction revenue. Um, we get compensated relative to an airline ticket being purchased and we get compensated as it relates to what we call passenger boarded. Um, so because that information, you know, I just shared with you, we saw what was happening very early on. And in February, you know, the initial steps that we took were just to, to do some minor things, um, you know, within running the business. So this time of the year is when you're actually doing promotions, you're doing merit increases. Uh, there's a number of things that are happening on the employee side. Uh, so we actually put those on pause. 
Uh, and the other thing is we pulled back our travel uh, and incidental expenses in that period of time. But very quickly thereafter, and I'm talking, this is happening within weeks, right? This is not, we're waiting like months. Um, this is like, we're watching this almost hourly and what's happening is we got into the phase in, in early March is, you know, I was having discussions with a number of airline executives, hotel executives around the world. You know, it was very clear that revenue was falling off quickly and what were we going to do? Because when you look at it, that amount of revenue coming out of our system very quickly um, is, is very impactful. So, you know, and I remember I was having breakfast actually with uh, an airline CEO here in Dallas and we were comparing notes. I went into the office, I had this big ink board in my conference room and I wrote on the board phase one, phase two and phase three. And phase one was really focused on, you know, how do we get expense out, more expense. And in doing that, uh, we put together a plan that we were going to get $200 million of expense out of, uh, of, out of our uh, you know, operating budget for 2020. Part of that was really focused on, you know, what is it going to happen? We did wage reductions. We offered voluntary early retirement, voluntary service plans. We were speaking with vendors and what's taking place. That was sort of phase one, got that done. Um, you know, lessons that I've learned from the past, cash is king in these situations. You've got to focus on cash. And in doing that, um, you know, I very quickly turned to the balance sheet. That was sort of phase two. And um, at, the, at this time, you're actually finding that the public markets are closing up a little bit uh, in what's happening. Um, the government was focused on the CARES program. So I was, I was engaged with the White House. I was engaged with the Treasury Department, uh, Department of Transportation, congressional leaders. Uh, on how do we get included into the bill that was uh, essentially uh, eventually passed. Uh, we were having discussions with private equity firms on do we do a pipe or do we other, do other forms of financing. Uh, and during that whole period of time, as you know, um, the Fed was doing a number of things to open up the marketplace. Uh, and, and then we decided uh, probably in the late March, early April timeframe that going to public markets was the right thing to do. Uh, and we ended up raising about $1.2 billion in cash to solidify our balance sheet. Um, so that was phase two. How do you make sure that you have cash that you can go for a period of time? And the way that we looked at it, and this is sort of a, what I cons consider to be the worst case scenario, uh, and we looked at it that uh, how could we operate for 18 months without any bookings or any passengers boarding? And what I will tell you, if we're in that situation, I think we have bigger problems. Um, but at least that's how we were focused on it, is making sure that we had cash uh, for the long term. We then moved into phase three, and we're really in that right now, um, is essentially what is the new world? Um, because it's happening right in front of us. And, you know, I'm of the belief that there's going to be a rather slow recovery to what's taking place here. Uh, you have to look at, you know, the engagement that you have uh, with your customers. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to understand, you know, what's happening with the traveler at the end of the day, because this is not only this is not a financial crisis that was driven based on financial sort of basis. This was a health crisis that turned into a financial crisis. And there's a lot that's going to go on relative to people, uh, people feeling comfortable traveling, getting, you know, moving into the new norm. So we're we're focused on phase three right now. And what does it look like in our in our organization? Yeah, we'll revisit phase three in a minute because I'm sure that that's what we all want to know about as well. And like you, I'm hoping that this is not an 18-month complete shutdown of travel. Uh, that, that would be a scenario we would all hate to contemplate. But let me back up just all the way to phase one. And when you talked about working with your employees, how do you maintain morale as a leader when uh, these are the kinds of steps that you're having to take? And potentially there's a sense of panic among the employees. What yeah. do you do? I, I think the important thing is, you know, in this situation, um, what I have found, and, and this goes back to when, when um, I was actually in Denver running Frontier Airlines during the financial crisis, um, is open, honest communication is just so important with your team members, with your employee base. And um, I, I do believe uh, arming them with factual information, it's just not me talking, it's actually sharing information. So that information that I shared with you, I was sharing with my employees for them to understand what was taking place. Uh, you know, the other thing that we were sharing is essentially the steps that we were doing. So I walked through sort of phase one, phase two, and how we were thinking about it. And you gotta be very balanced in your communication what's taking place. Um, the other thing that was very important for the employees really was their own personal health and safety. 
um, you know, as I was walking you through what the actions we were taking, what I didn't mention is, you know, we went to, we have a tier program, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one is the offices are open and you're expected to be in the office. Tier two is the offices are open, but you have the opportunity from work from home or do what you would like. It essentially is what it boils down to. And then finally, tier three is uh, work from home. And we went from tier two in early March to tier three at the end of March. And again, those are the things that we were very focused on. And, you know, I do pretty much a weekly note to the employees. I do a lot of um, uh, videos. I actually shoot my own videos with my Apple iPhone and I send it into they do it. Uh, and then we do town halls. I've done a, a couple of town halls. We actually did one earlier this week. So communication is just so important in a, in a world of uncertainty. To what extent are these things that you started after this uh, pandemic hit and after we were in this crisis mode? And to what extent is it important that we have that foundation before we ever get to this point? Yeah, well, listen, I think, you know, building confidence in an organization relative to leadership and what you're doing is, is the utmost importance because when you get in times of crisis, you know, you need to be able to look each other in the eyes and understand this is a real situation and this is what we need to do. And uh, in doing that, that, that has been just a, a strong belief of mine is um, sharing information because you know, when you get in these tough situations, you're going to ask people to do more than what they typically do. And what I have found, and I'm seeing it right now, when you, when you ask people to jump two feet, they'll jump five feet to get the things done. And But you got to continue to move forward. Because, you know, the one thing that I have communicated, and you're seeing this not only uh, with what I'm doing in my organization, but other organizations, um, the size of the organization of where it was before this happened, and the size of the organization of where it will be at the end of this, the different organizations, I think it's just going to be, they're going to be smaller and it goes back to the economic front. Yeah, that's interesting. A couple of lessons that are starting to emerge as common themes is uh, you've got to have open and transparent communication. You've got to have built up trust with your team before this ever happens so that they are willing to go along with you on the journey, which is a tough journey to take. And the other one, of course, is cash is king. Everyone's looking at that. Um, so, you know, I, I hate to bring this up, but in a sense, this is not your first rodeo when it comes to managing an organization through a crisis, especially a travel-based. So you were CEO of Frontier Airlines in 2008, which was, of course, the last time we had this kind of a serious economic downturn. Do you see similarities or dissimilarities between what you had to deal with then and now? And are there common leadership principles that translate across them and, or don't work? No, it, it, I mean, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I, I really love my time at, at, at Frontier. Um, you know, I've been with that organization for a long time. Um, and, I, and I thought I wouldn't, I thought I was never going to have to sort of relive those memories, right? Um, and there, there were some very tough times uh, in, 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 during that situation. But, you know, in, in fairness, um, and I've shared this, you know, with my board and a number of uh, employees, but you sort of have this playbook in your head of what you need to do when, when you get in those situations. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting. You, I, I'm of the belief that you have to be very clear. You have to have clear thoughts, but you have to be very decisive in what you're doing as well. And, you know, in doing that, um, you're not going to have all the information you need because if you're going to try to overanalyze, you're going to continue to analyze forever because when the information is falling away from you, and that's the way it was back in 2000, you know, roughly 2008, there's a lot of just unknown of what the future looked like. And so I'm of the belief that you have to gather the information that you have and you have to be decisive. And I go back to cash is king, right? You got to look at the balance sheet because you don't know how long this is going to go. Uh, the forms of communication are really, really important. And we talk about, you know, communications uh, to the team members, but, you know, in this situation, um, because of our mission critical, for example, I needed to make sure that airlines, hoteliers, agencies around the world felt comfortable that we had the balance sheet to see this through, right? Because if we're not operating, those airlines aren't operating. Um, and I needed to make sure that they felt comfortable. So there's a level of communication there. Uh, you know, in the frontier example, um, you know, it was a lot of just local state and federal government uh, officials, you know, making sure that they understood what was taking place. And then the employee communication was just so, so important in what's taking, how you lead through these things. So I, I will tell you a lot of lessons that I learned back at Frontier are, are things that I'm leaning on right now. Yeah. 
interesting. Is there one thing that you said, if I had to revisit this, I'd do it differently? Or is there one thing that keeps you up at night and says, that says, how do I deal with this situation, with this aspect of the challenge I'm facing? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a great question. Um, because, you know, I, I find these situations and, and sort of how I could characterize them for, for individuals is, it's almost like there's three dimensional chess that's being playing 24 seven because things are moving around so much. And, you know, you really need to think that way. I, to be honest with you, I spend the most time thinking about and I worry about, it, it's my team. Um, because we have smart people, we can work our way through this. I'm, I truly believe that. Um, you have to keep your team members engaged because they're the ones that actually have to do the work, right? Um, you know, I'll give the final say on the big things that are taking place out there, but you, you not only have to think about today, and I'm spending a lot of time thinking about this, is that I think this is going to be for a prolonged period of time. We're not just going to come, this is not a B recovery. I'm just, I, I will tell you all the data that I look, this is not a B recovery. And it does get into how do you think about your team members? How do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them focused on the future? How do you focus on the opportunity? Uh, because you still have to run a business. And if that, anything keeps me up at night, it just, it, it's that. Because they make it all happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's always about the people, right? Uh, ultimately, uh, that's what it really boils down to. And as a leader, you have to worry about your people more than anything else. So let's uh, pivot a little bit to the recovery. You said it's not a V recovery. Uh, I was in a session earlier today where, you know, I've heard the V recovery, sort of the swoosh recovery. Uh, someone this morning actually mentioned that there was a prediction that this is going to be a square root recovery. And I, I'm still trying to figure that one out. So I don't know what that actually even means. If you figure that one out, let me know. Yeah, if I, if I do, we'll be in touch. Uh, but tell us a little bit about what you were expecting in terms of how the industry will recover. Because, you know, of all the industries, besides maybe going out to eat, travel is one that we all interface with. Right? Um, you know, and I think this will provide you know sort of a, a headline is you know uh, shortly after all this happened we withdrew guidance uh, financial guidance from the street and, and that just tells you we don't know is, is what it boils down to but um, you know the nice thing about it is we have an enormous amount of information at our fingertips but um, I think this is different in recovery and I'm actually going to fly later tonight um, I'm flying to Ohio to visit my parents um, and you know, there's been a lot of consternation uh, as it relates to my family in doing that. And that's an important point that I'm making because, um, you know, as you know, I, I live here in Texas and as uh, different states open up and as different countries open up, I, I think there's going to be the psyche relative to how people feel about going out. When are they ready to go to a restaurant? When are they ready to go to a movie theater? Or when are they ready to go to a ballpark? When are they ready to go stay in a hotel room? When are they ready to go to an when I think about that, that to me is the recovery and the level of confidence that's taking place. Um, and so when I look at it, um, you know, there's still countries around the world that have their borders closed. Poland's still got their borders closed. Argentina's got their borders closed. Um, I think you're going to see a recovery bigger, uh, faster in domestic travel versus international travel. Um, but, I, but I do believe it's going to be slow and we're going to see incremental movement taking place. Uh, as it relates to that. So I don't know if that's a perfect answer, but it, it, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough answer. It, it is. And, you know, the challenge with a perfect answer, of course, is that this is a world where none of us really knows what the next few months is going to bring. And there's a lot of uncertainty. So we can only, you know, try to anticipate as best as possible. So you said that domestic will come back faster than international. And I have no doubt because obviously there are concerns at the rate at which this pandemic is spreading across the world. Different nations will be closed at different times as well. Within domestic, do you anticipate business versus leisure, a difference in how they come back? Yeah, that, that, that's another good question. So we're already seeing signs that leisure traffic is, is coming back um, faster than business traffic. And, and that example is, is, information we sit on, I can look at, you know, the, the TMC travel management company. So that's where a lot of the corporate travel is, is managed. And what you're finding is that that has not improved since late March. Um, like myself, right? Um, I have a ban on travel right now. Uh, and I'm a travel company. So <laughs> I 
tells you a lot. But what we are seeing more on the online um, travel agencies, the Expedia, the travel agencies of the world, um, the travelize in Europe, is that we're actually beginning to see movement there. And that's what we thought we would see. And this gets into, you know, airlines around the world that are putting some cheap fares out there. It, it's interesting, you hear about the amount of capacity that's being cut, but if you look at a lot of these airlines over the summertime, the vast majority of their capacity from a marketing perspective is still being sold. What they'll do is the closer they get to the travel date, they'll cancel that down. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at it, leisure is definitely booking. Um, if you actually look at bookings in the July timeframe, uh, they're actually greater than the month of May as we're tracking the full month of May. So you're seeing a level of confidence out there, but I think it, it'll really begin to, um, it, as people, more and more people travel, the question would be, do people get more confident? Yeah, interesting. Um, so if you were to advise a leisure traveler, you know, you're trying to balance this, okay, they're gonna cut capacity, flights are gonna get canceled, that might lead to higher fares. And at the same time, there's a discount fares. If I wanna travel in August, should I book now or wait till July? Another unfair question, Sean, but- Very unfair question. <laughs> They're all refundable right now, so you could actually, you know, everything's sort of refundable at this time. So that's a good out. point, yeah. I mean, that's what they're trying to do. I think there's a balance. I mean, I do a lot of shopping just to see what's happening in the marketplace. Um, in fairness, the fares aren't as low as I thought they would be in the market. Um, but, it, but it is. Um, this goes back to what we had talked about earlier, just from a revenue management perspective. I'm not sure how revenue management, revenue managers is going to be very difficult. Yeah. So a uh, final question before uh, we bring on the questions from the audience is, you mentioned earlier that um, you think that the long-term steady state for you is going to be a smaller company. What do you think is going to be the new normal when it comes to business and corporate travel? And related to that, what advice or what would you say to the prospective traveler that gives them comfort that it's okay to travel or what should they be looking for? No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And, you know, it's... Um, I'm a big believer that, you know, the, the more you become a seasoned executive or just a seasoned individual, you learn a lot about the past, right? And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion, you know, amongst colleagues of mine that, and I would take you back to 9-11. And uh, even though it was more North American centric and what took place, because that's, that, that's where the events transpired, is you had a different but similar type of thing that took place. Um, and there was things that you could do from a safety perspective back then. This is a little different because of the, the, the health side of the equation. Um, but when, when, when I look at it, you know, uh, there's no doubt in my mind. And, and, you know, I'm sitting in front of my computer eight or nine hours a day doing video conferencing. Um, listen, I'm a strong proponent at the end of the day. Business does get done face to face. Um, and I do believe that that's going to be a return. Um, I do believe that the workplace is going to change though. This is one of the things that, and I don't think it's just the workplace. I just think it, if you look at it from, you know, the digital virtual opportunities that you have right now, I have three boys that are in school um, and they're doing it virtual right now in, in e-learning and you're doing it at Daniel's at, at DU. A lot of this is going on. And uh, I will tell you that um, the level of productivity that I've seen in our business is amazing. I did that $1.2 billion transaction sitting right where I'm sitting. Um, you know, I've done everything that I walk you through sitting right where I'm sitting. Um, but, you know, we had our earnings call um, last week and I went into the office. I will tell you, I miss the office too. But I think at the end of the day, my, my, my point is, is when you look at the work environment, you look at just education, uh, and I think going back to the employees, for me, what it's learned is I think the employee experience has got to be different going forward too, driving to more flexibility. If you're not thinking about that, uh, the health aspect on you know how people feel about coming into an office or not coming into an office, I will tell you, I, I am um, my mind has been changed. When I think about travel and, and travel moving forward, you know I, I've seen the industry overcome a lot. Um, but a lot of it's going to focus on, it's interesting, yes, there's going to be the health and safety component of it, and we're already seeing a number of things that are taking place as it relates to that. Um, you, you hear about, you know, are airlines going to block the middle seat? Um, you know, what are they going to do as it relates to what's taking place? Uh, hotels have a number of things. I was actually on a call uh, with a number of airline executives as well as hotel executives, 
the question is how do they actually work together more because it's not only about that air trip, but it's also once you're at a destination that's ground and it's the lodging. Uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of questions relative to you know, the Airbnb uh, of the world, sort of the sharing economy. Are people gonna feel more comfortable going into an enterprise uh, or a large independent hotelier because of the standards that they're putting in place. So I think there's a lot that's there, but you know, the, the big thing, and this is what I keep telling people, is is as difficult it, as it is and what's going on, I, I also have the belief that there's opportunity that comes out of it. And you know, I think that you know, the best leaders, the best leaders that are out there are one, managing what they need to manage, and one is the critical component of your employees and what they're dealing with right now, your customers. But you got to keep your mindset on the future and how do you begin to think about the opportunities in that future? And we're spending a lot of time doing that, going back to what I said as sort of phase three. Yeah, and that's great advice to uh, in this part of the program on, which is, and I was seeing a chart that someone shared with me that said the companies that really come out of something like this strong start to separate themselves during the crisis, not waiting till after the crisis, which is exactly the point that you're making, which is you cannot just be concentrating on how do I survive this? It's also about how do I plan to reposition myself better for whatever the future is likely to be. That was fascinating to hear a little bit about what's going on in the travel industry behind the scenes a little bit. And of course, your insights on leadership and how you manage through this and prepare for the future at the same time. So thank you for those insights. Yeah. Uh, thank you also to everyone in the audience for joining us today. And I welcome you to join us for the next virtual Voices of Experience event, which will be on May 26th. And our guest will be Amy King, Chief People Officer of Centura Health. With that, thanks again, Sean. It was a bit delight to have this conversation. Great, thank you so much. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.